Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is James Madison, Part 1. James Madison was the fourth president of the United States of America. He succeeded George Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. And his life is very inspiring. He, uh, he proved the importance of, of history. He loved reading history books. And, uh, he, and he decided at a young age that uh, government was important. And he, he spent a lot of time reading history books about government and politics. And all that learning that he did, all the, all the history books that he read, was the f decisive factor, the most important uh, thing behind the creation of the U.S. Constitution, in which the United States became one country. After the American Revolution, we were independent of Great Britain, but we were not one country. We were basically 13 independent countries with a very weak central government. When the U.S. Constitution became law, we, we really became one country. And James Madison is the father of the U.S. Constitution, the most important person behind that creation you know, when, we, when the presidency was created and Congress and the Supreme Court and so forth. So a very incredible life that he lived. He was the uh, shortest president. He was only five foot four. He weighed 100 pounds. And he, he was a real smart guy. The thing is, he was very humble. He never, he, he didn't agree that with the title that he was the father of the U.S. Constitution because he was a very humble man. He's very patient, very persevering, very good guy. He also is the, uh, was the author of the Bill of Rights. And he, uh, he was a huge help for George Washington during Washington's presidency. Very big help. And he was a tremendous help for Thomas Jefferson as well. They were very good friends. And together, Jefferson and James Madison uh, helped the United States become a land of religious freedom. Madison's wife, Dolly, was a, was a very famous first lady and a wonderful person. And very, very, we'll talk a lot about her. James Madison led the United States during the War of 1812. Uh, he he had definitely had health problems. And it's debatable whether he had epilepsy or uh, he had these nervous. Some uh, historians have said that he had a he had these uh, fits of nervousness where he would be overcome by nerves. And so anyway, wonderful man, very inspiring, and certainly should be remembered. James Madison was born on March 16, 1751, in Port Conway, Virginia, in Orange County. And that's about uh, 12 miles from Fredericksburg, a few miles northeast of Monticello, and uh, Thomas Jefferson's home. It was very convenient because they were such good friends. He was the oldest of 10 children. They called him Jemmy. He was uh, actually James Madison Jr. Uh, growing up, he loved the outdoors and he loved books. Now, some important geography we need to get into is uh, about Virginia. Virginia had uh, four very uh, very important rivers, very navigable rivers, and the Potomac, the Rappahannock, and the York, and the James. Now, we know that Virginia was the uh, actually the wealthiest colony when independence came and had the, the largest population, largely due to tobacco. But there were no major cities. Strange, you know, Phil, nothing, 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 no big cities like Philadelphia, Boston, New York, or whatever. So, uh, and the thing is that because of these rivers, the farmers would bring their tobacco to the closest, wherever was uh, the river, whatever was closest, whichever river was closest, and then it would be shipped downstream and then over to Europe. So that meant cities were unnecessary in Virginia. Very interesting. During uh, James Madison's growing up years, uh, oyster suppers were popular and squirrel, squirrel barbecues and the minuet was the was the popular dance. He was born in his grandparents' home, Montpellier. Of course, his his uh, you know a lot of people visit uh, Monticello, but not not too many people come to visit Montpellier, his famous home. In 1762, uh, Madison started attending a boarding school on the banks of the Mattapani River, and the uh, the teacher was D Donald Robertson guy from Scotland. And actually, uh, Madison developed a Scottish accent, partly because of this. And, he, and Madison was forever grateful to this Donald Robertson. You know, he had some wonderful teachers. 
which uh, really helped him become a scholar. And um, uh, so this uh, Donald, Donald Robertson did a very good job. Now, when it, when it came time to go to college, you would naturally would expect, it would, have, would, have, would have been expected that he would have gone to the College of William and Mary in Virginia. But he didn't go there, and for, for different reasons. He had health problems, and uh, uh, Williamsburg, where the College of William and Mary is, is near the Atlantic Ocean, and it's the, in the lowlands, what they call the tide water, and it tend to be, there tended to be disease in the summer from mosquitoes. And that was one of the reasons that, and that he didn't go. His parents, you know, he was kind of sickly, actually, growing up. And there was also problems in Virginia with, uh, with the Anglican Church, um, Madison's family was in favor of religious freedom, and they didn't really go for the persecution in Virginia uh, by the Anglican Church, and the Anglican Church dominated the College of William and Mary. And then, and then, then another thing that happened, there had, been, there had been, quote, troubling reports of rioting, drinking, and all-night card games there at the College of William and Mary. So he did not go to that college. They thought it would be better for him to go north to a, a more healthy climate. So he, he went to college at what's now called Princeton University. Back then it was called the College of New Jersey. Uh, it, so he went to, this is in Princeton, New Jersey. And he really had three, actually three wonderful years there. And this is really where he was exposed to the ideas of religious freedom, which are very popular in New Jersey. Not really, not so much in, in Virginia, except for his family and, and, and some of the people. There was only one, one main road in, uh, in Princeton at the time, and there were 80 houses. Nassau Hall is where he spent most of his three years there, and they were, they were very happy years. And he really enjoyed studying history and government. So he had, he had a very good experience at, uh, at, uh, at, at what's now Princeton. And, of course, Madison was, wasn't just a scholar. He was also he was a very personable man. Sometimes people didn't didn't see it because he was tended to be shy in public, but he was very personable and, and had, had, had many friends throughout his life. And he joined this, uh, they had these, in college, there were debating societies that you would join, and then there were, they, were, they were rivals. And Madison wrote a poem, uh, wrote abusive poems about other college, this other college debating society. He wrote this quote, Come, noble Whigs, that would be, that would be Madison society, they were the Whigs. Disdain these sons of screech owls, monkeys, and baboons. So a little humor from, from, from Madison's uh, uh, college years. Now, he, as I said, he, he had health problems. There are some scholars believe his home, Montpellier, was named after the town in southern France where the English philosopher John Locke went to repair his health. So because of John Locke was one of the one of the authors that, that uh, Madison and, and Thomas Jefferson greatly admired. Ma Madison decided to finish college early. You know, he was a young man on a mission, and he, he combined his junior and senior years in, in one year, two years in one. And he called this, quote, an indiscreet experiment of the minimum sleep and the maximum ap application which the Constitution would bear. I think this was a mistake because it was, it was too hard Kind of too bad that he didn't enjoy another his, another a fourth year, because. Uh, but anyway, this is what he did. And after college, he was exhausted and depressed in 1772, and he wrote his friend William Bradford not to count on too much from the world. And he wrote this quote: "I hope you are sufficiently guarded against the allurements and vanities that beset us on our first entrance on the theater of life. Yet, however nice and cautious we may be." in detecting the follies of mankind and framing our economy according to the precepts of wisdom and religion, I fancy there will commonly remain with us some latent expectation of obtaining more than ordinary happiness and prosperity till we feel the convincing argument of actual disappointment. As to myself, I am too dull and infirm now to look out for, my, for any extraordinary things in this world for I think my sensations for many months past have intimated to me not to expect a long or happy life. <clears throat> you can see his depression after college, actually not only from working too much, but actually he, you know, he really missed college. 
one of the uh, authors he read in, in college was Cardinal de Retz, who, who wrote, quote, To lessen envy is the greatest of all secrets. Yeah, this is an interesting topic because, you know, if you do well in life, people will be jealous of you. And if they're jealous, they might try to, to destroy you. So if we can lessen, for those who succeed in life, if they can lessen envy, it's good. Uh, <clears throat> author Michael Seiner wrote this, quote, after, this is after Madison finished college, quote, James Madison badly missed the friendship of school, the ease of conversation, and the bonding around ideas in the close quarters of Nassau Hall. For the rest of his life, he would seek to recreate the intensity of friendship around ideas wherever he could, whether with Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, or James Monroe. Actually, after college, he came home and he worked as a tutor for his father for his uh, tutoring his younger children, and he became depressed. He was very unhappy, didn't know what he was going to do with his life. Kind of like John Adams, who you know was a teacher after uh, after Harvard, and was also became was pretty unhappy. So after college, this is 1774. Madison really didn't know what he would do with his life. You know, he didn't. Uh, for the time being, his father wanted him tutoring his younger children because he'd had such a good education. During this time, 1774, the Baptist church was growing. The Anglican church really wasn't doing such a good job. You know, they were the, it was favored by the government in England and in the colonies, and uh, it was not, uh, not doing, really, these uh, Anglican ministers were not doing a good job. So there were other churches that were growing, including the Baptist uh, church was, was growing and becoming very popular. And so since the Anglican church was favored by the colonial government, this, uh, this, th there started this persecution, and Baptist ministers were being arrested in Virginia. And Madison wrote this, quote, That diabolical, hell-conceived principle of persecution rages among some. Religious bondage shackles and debilitates the mind and unfits it for every noble enterprise, every expanded prospect. Yeah, so this was one of the important contributions of his life, working with Thomas Jefferson, helping the United States become a land of religious freedom. And he saw firsthand in Virginia the, the abuse of, 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 of religious abuse, the lack of religious freedom, that these Baptists were being persecuted. Uh, Madison decided to study to become a lawyer like uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, although he never, he never was able to, 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 to become a lawyer. And he wrote this, he wanted to study the law, not to become a lawyer, but because, quote, the principles and modes of government are too important to be disregarded by an inquisitive mind, and I think are well worthy of a critical examination by all students that have health and leisure. So he, yeah, he never practiced law. In fact, he found, he found studying law very boring, but it, some of it did help him in his work in politics, because his, his career really was in politics, that, so that... That's really became his career. In 1775, uh, there was a uh, there was an outbreak of dysentery, and his younger sister Elizabeth, age seven, and brother Reuben, age four, died that year of dysentery. This is a this is a, a, a disease caused by dirty drinking water, and this is, these were the fourth and fifth of his siblings to die. So he was the oldest of ten children, but five of his five of his siblings died. Very tragic. In 1775, the uh, American Revolution started, and uh, Madison was very enthusiastic, enthusiastic in his support for the revolution. And you know, he was he wanted to serve in the military. He wanted to, so he enlisted in the Orange County Militia in Virginia. Uh, things didn't work out because of because of he had this. It's, again, it's debatable whether he had epilepsy or these uh, fits of nervousness. In July of 1775, as a member of the Virginia militia, they were having a firing drill, and Madison collapsed to the ground, crippled by anxiety. And this was the end of his military career. So he, he, his whole life, he felt bad about this. That, that you know, he kind of felt that he was a coward. Although you know, he definitely contributed. There are different ways to contribute in a war, not just being a soldier. And he definitely contributed in a, in a major way during the American Revolution as uh, in, in government. In 1776, Madison was elected to the Virginia legislature. 
He was he was 25 years old, and this was the the, the American Revolution was on. He helped write the Virginia State Constitution, and he met Thomas Jefferson, and they became lifelong friends. And this is a wonderful uh, friendship and political par partnership, because he was such a such a tremendous help to Thomas Jefferson. We all need help. Every great leader needs help, and Thomas Jefferson got tremendous help from James Madison. The following year, Madison was, was defeated in his re-election bid uh, to the Virginia re legislature because he did not provide alcohol at the polls, free rum, which was expected by the voters. So that was uh, so he learned from that. He didn't he didn't believe in in in, in the practice, but it, and he paid the price. But that was not the end of his political career. Actually, he came from a, Madison was from a very uh, power, a wealthy family. So this, you know, this definitely led him to, to have opportunities. And so he was appointed after this defeat to Governor Patrick Henry's council. So he's part of the uh, advisors to the to the to the governor. The following uh, two years later, so actually, yeah, see, he worked with Patrick Henry for a couple of years when Henry was the governor, and of course they. They became, eventually, uh, years later, they became political, political enemies. By 1779, Thomas Jefferson was governor of Virginia during the, this, again, this is during the uh, American Revolution, and they became lifelong. They were, well, they had known each other, but they, they, this uh, cemented their friendship, and they were very, very good friends. Uh, historian Lynn Cheney wrote, quote, They encouraged, defended, and had a profound effect on each other, and on the nation they helped build. By 1780, uh, Madison was elected to the national government, the, the Continental Congress. He was the youngest member. He served for three years. This is the latter part of the, of the American Revolution. So he, he did see the problems. He, of course, even in Virginia, he was aware of the problems that we were having with, our, with, our, with a weak national government. He served three years. There was a you can only serve a maximum of three one-year terms. But he saw during this time how problematic it was because the national government was extremely weak. That's one of the reasons that made it very tough to win the, to win the War of Independence against Great Britain. Back in, uh, when the war ended in 1783, uh, Mad uh, Madison returned to Virginia and was back in the Virginia legislature for a couple years. And during this time, he helped pass the Virginia Religious Freedom Statute, which had been initiated by Thomas Jefferson. So this was very important. One of the, you know, one of the greatest things about the United States is religious freedom. People from all over the world have come. You know, we've gotten all these talented people, Jewish people, uh, Christians of various denominations, and other religions in modern time, more modern times, Buddhists, Hist Hindus, Muslims, and they, they contribute to help make America great. And James Madison was the guy who, along with Thomas Jefferson, who helped make that happen. In 1784, uh, there was debate about, uh, you know, there were problems with uh, the fact that the, uh, the national government was so weak. And there, was, there were uh, efforts to revise the Virginia Constitution. Uh, however, Patrick Henry, yeah, he was really against creating a stronger national government. And so he was, they were, he became an opponent of Madison and Jefferson. And uh, Jefferson, by this time, was in Paris during his about five years working as a U.S. diplomat, diplomat, and he was corresponding with Madison, and he wrote, quote, quote, while Mr. Henry lives, another bad constitution would be formed and saddled forever on us. What we have to do, I think, is devoutly pray for his death. Now, Patrick Henry is the guy who, early in the, in the war, well, very early, he'd, you know, he'd uh, made the famous quote, give me liberty or give me death, which was so inspiring. But then later he became problematic. You know, he was, uh, he was against the U.S. Constitution. So uh, anyway, in 1784, uh, Madison was working to revise the Virginia laws, which, you know, had originally been written by the British and had, there were problems with those laws. And so there was this, uh, uh, get together. One of the delegates wrote about Madison, quote, can you suppose it is possible that Madison should shine with more than usual splendor this assembly? The thing about James Madison, he was a very, you know, he was very knowledgeable. All this reading that he did, he was a very, you know, loved to read and learn. Very hard worker, very patient, and very, very humble. 
and, 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 but determined. And so he was really a very inspiring guy. That same year, 1784, Madison had a chance encounter with the Marquis de Lafayette, this French guy who had come and served in the American Revolution. Lafayette invited Madison on a trip to Fort Stanwyck, New York, where there was going to be a treaty signed between the United States and the Iroquois Confederacy. Very interesting. And uh, Madison was lobbying Lafayette for French pressure on Spain to open the Mississippi River to American shipping. This was a really big, very important uh, thing in, in early on. The Mississippi River, which was such a vital waterway and transportation route for farmers to get their crops to the eastern markets rather than going the slow route by land to the east, getting on the Mississippi River system down to New Orleans and over to the east coast. And, of course, there were problems with, as, as this indicates, that Spain at that time controlled the Mississippi, although France had, had, had power. Now, the war was over. The American Revolution had been won. However, we were not one country, and there were problems. We were weak. We were like Central America. And so there was a, a meeting in 1786 in Annapolis, Mar Annapolis, Maryland, to discuss some of the problems that, that existed between the states. And, and nothing much came of that meeting, but they, they agreed to have another meeting the following year. And uh, this was the Constitutional Convention, 1787. And James Madison was the leader in organizing this. And, and the, the meeting which resulted in the U.S. Constitution being created. And one of the things he, he realized he needed to do was to get George Washington to attend. So he, spent, he started spending a lot of time trying to convince Washington, who did not want to come, who was tired from the war, but he, you know, Madison convinced him, said, we need your help. And these various problems that happened, Shays' Rebellion in Massachusetts, with uh, that there was, no, there was no national army to deal with, so there was a sense that, wow, we, we have to create a, a stronger national government. And Madison wrote this late in 1786, quote, The crisis is arrived at which the good people of America are to decide the solemn question whether they will, by wise and magnanimous efforts, reap the just fruits of independence which they have so gloriously acquired, or whether they will renounce the auspicious blessings prepared for them by the revolution. You know, during the revolution, it was, it was so tough to win the war because of a very weak national government, and the same problems were ongoing. We were not one country. So, 1787 was the big year of the Constitutional Convention, when we became one country, when the U.S. Constitution was created and, and, and a, at this meeting in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Some of the famous people who came included John Rutledge of South Carolina, Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, and Benjamin Franklin, who was 81 years old, one of the last things that he did with his life. Madison wrote in 1787, quote, There is no maxim, in my opinion, which is more liable to be misapplied and which therefore more needs elucidation than the current one, that the interest of the majority is the political standard of right and wrong. This is a very important point, how we need to respect uh, the minorities, the minority. So by May, in May of 1787, Madison was in New York City, which he seemed to spend a lot of time, and he left New York for Philadelphia. The convention was supposed to start on May 14th. However, on that day, only the Pennsylvania and Virginia delegates had arrived because it was a wet spring and the roads were very muddy, so it was hard for the fellows to, to get there on time. And so, so it, it, the, the convention was delayed until May 25th. It was held at the Pennsylvania State House, where the Declaration of Independence had been signed, 1776, so 11 years before. And this was, uh, Madison called this meeting of the Constitutional Convention, uh, it was, quote, to decide forever the fate of Republican government. And when he uses the word Republican, we're now, nowadays we usually talk about democracy, but back then it was, that's really... You know, well, that's actually a more accurate word, but, but we, we no longer use, uh, when we talk about, a today we talk about democracy, it's, it's really what they used to call Republican. Madison was only 36 years old in 1787, you know, not that old, and amazing, 
you know, that he, that he had this very powerful role. And he, he, he was the man of the hour. He, he was the, really the driving force behind the Constitutional Convention. He was a uh, delegate from Virginia. Then after the convention, he uh, contributed essays to the Federalist Papers, which promoted the Constitution. He read all these books that were sent by Thomas Jefferson in Europe. Later, he had to fight Patrick Henry in Virginia over ratification. And so, so he really, boy, it's really something. But anyway, we're jumping ahead of the story a little bit. At, at, early in the convention, Constitutional Convention, Madison said this, quote, I go on this Republican principle that the people will have virtue and intelligence to select men of virtue and wisdom. Is there no virtue among us? If there be not, we are in a wretched situation. No theoretical check, no form of government can render us secure. To suppose that any form of government will secure liberty or happiness without any virtue in the people is a chimerical idea. If there be sufficient virtue and intelligence in the community, it will be exercised in the selection of these men, so that we do not depend on their virtue or put confidence in our rulers, but in the people who are to choose them. I think that you've, this is such an important point that you've, if you study early American history, you hear over and over again. And we need to remember, think about today, you know, that his idea is that what's important in a country is the virtue in the people. Nowadays, there's all this blaming of, of uh, everyone wants to blame Congress, blame Donald Trump, when we all are to blame. And if our country will succeed today, it, it will only be because we are a good people. And uh, if we fail, it's because we're not a good people. And again, I, I think the, uh, the important point is how do we become a good people? Or how do we improve our character? How do we become virtuous through God contact, since God is a source of goodness? So... Anyway, this is an important thing to remember, you know, because and I, you don't hear this talked about very much. Well, except among, among certain Christian leaders. One of the delegates at the Constitutional Convention wrote about Madison, quote, Every person seems to acknowledge his greatness. He blends together the profound politician with the scholar. In the manage management of every great question, he evidently took the lead in the convention. And though he cannot be called an orator, he is the most agreeable, eloquent, and convincing speaker. The affairs of the United States, he perhaps has the most correct knowledge of any man in the Union. They had a secrecy rule at the convention. In other words, the, the guys weren't, this was not, what they were saying every day was not for public consumption. Because they wanted, they wanted the guys to feel free to, to speak their minds without fear of, of public repercussions. And this was a controversial thing. People thought, what are you guys doing in secret in there? Madison wrote about the secrecy rule, quote, No constitution would ever have been adopted by the convention if the debates had been public. In other words, there were no public spectators. Now, probably the big, one of the, maybe the biggest conflict they had was over small states and big states, the conflict between those two groups. And, uh, you know, the small states were worried that they would be dominated in a new government, and they didn't want that. So the small states wanted equal representation in, in the legislature, and the big states wanted representation based on population. So there was this real impasse, and they couldn't seem to work it out. Benjamin Franklin spoke at this time, and he addressed President George Washington, who was the president of the Constitutional Convention. Quote, In this situation of this assembly groping as it were in the dark to find political truth and scarce able to distinguish it when presented to us. How has it happened, sir, that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to, lum to illuminate our understanding? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? So this was, you know, this is a real problem. So anyway, we will continue next time. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, God bless you and have a good day.